Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Ham on Rye by Charles Bukowski. So this is actually a reread for me. I reread this via audiobook as one of the prompts for last year's rereadathon. I actually fell super behind with it. Um, well, I DNF'd my reread of A Monster Calls because I didn't like it the first time, and then I wasn't enjoying the reread. Uh, it had a really bad narrator, and that that kind of threw me off things. But I've been trying to get back to it this year to try and catch up with the prompts that I missed, and then you know to participate with rereadathon this year. So I've been re so I've been listening to my audiobook of uh, Hamon Rai. It is kind of annoying because it's not got the best narrator, and he keeps putting on this really bad fake German accent um, because Bukowski is of German heritage and origin. So he's trying to pretend to be Bukowski's mum and stuff, and it just doesn't work. But uh, yeah, I'm going to read this the blurb to you. So. Legendary Barfly Charles Bukowski's fourth novel, first published in 1982, is probably the most autobiographical and moving of all his books, dealing in particular with his difficult relationship with his father and his early childhood in L.A. Hamon Rye follows the path of Bukowski's alter ego Henry Chinaski through the high school years of acne and rejection and into the beginning of a long and successful career in alcoholism. The novel begins against the backdrop of an America devastated by the Depression and takes the Chinaski legend up to the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Hamon Rai is arguably Ch Bukowski's finest novel. And yeah, it is kind of first uh, chronologically. But I don't know if I would necessarily recommend this book if you're not a Bukowski fan. I actually wrote, I think I only find this interesting because I was already a Bukowski fan when I picked it up. Um, because of his poetry. I think if I was new to him, I'd be a bit less interested because it is just the child, you know, the biography of the childhood years of some random dude if you've not, you know, come across his work before. As I say, the, the narrator's German accents are kind of annoying. And his mum keeps calling his dad Daddy in a German accent. So she'll be like, Bitte, Daddy! Wo ist die Schlossmuseum? Yeah, that was my, my German. Alright, so I have spent a lot of time today listening to this audiobook. So I have a bunch of updates for you. So, uh, one thing I meant I would notice, there's a lot of casual racism. They're talking about Chinese people and Japanese people. Basically saying, I think he was, one of the kids was saying that uh, Chinese people, when they die, they just split into two so that, you, you know, you can't just defeat them or whatever. There was also a woman who was defending her partner for raping someone. She said that maybe he just couldn't help himself. But, um, you know, Bukowski himself was a bit of a misogynist and a womanizer, and I know that, you know. Uh, I think I can do a pretty decent job of separating the artist from the art, but obviously not everyone could. Um, he kind of presents everybody as awful in his stories, uh, like kids are awful as well. So for example, at his school, any boy who had an umbrella or a raincoat was singled out. They were considered a sissy and beat up after school. And the reason for that is because most of the kids came from poor families and so they couldn't afford them. And actually some of the, fam some of the kids whose families could afford them, they would hide their raincoats and umbrellas rather than, um, you know, rather than single themselves out for, for abuse. Uh, Bukowski himself, his parents were beating him mostly as father and uh, he was thinking to himself that maybe they weren't his parents. They must have adopted him and been disappointed with how he turned out, which is, you know, pretty heartbreaking. And th one, this is th that's kind of reflected by this bit of dialogue. One of his teachers says, your parents don't give you much love, do they? And he says, I don't need that stuff. A great quote I really enjoyed. You can't get blood out of a fucking turnip. And... Yeah, the, then he was at a swimming pool and this woman wanted him to touch her. And she said, touch my cunt. If you don't, I'll tell the lifeguard you molested me and you'll be put in jail. So he has to touch this lady's, uh, yeah. One of my favourite things from this, he had to write an essay on when the president visited town. But he couldn't actually go to see the president's visit. Because on Saturdays he had to mow the lawn and, you know, his dad would beat him up if he didn't mow the lawn. So he just made it up and it turned out to be the best essay. And the teacher read it out to the class. And uh, then she held him behind afterwards and she asked him if he was really there and he said no he wasn't. And she told him that made it even more remarkable that he'd been able to write it. One of the, one of the lines I liked he said, Any, anybody could be a good guy, that didn't take guts. I liked being bad, being good made me sick. Another just this really disturbing kind of little detail but that helps to make Bukowski's stuff pretty realistic. Uh, one kid said that every time he got an F his father pulled out one of his fingernails. And um... Yeah, the boys were talking about Lily at school. The boys were saying Lily's no longer a virgin. And someone asked who got her, which I think is a very telling language choice. And it turns out her father, her father got her. Mm. That was the summer that uh, Dillinger got fingered as well. Uh, the, word, the choice of fingered made me laugh. But So yeah, when was Dillinger uh, dead? When was he killed? When was he, uh, June the 30th, 1934. So yeah, this is in the 1930s. This, all this is happening. 
Um, his father had lost his job. In fact, most of the men had lost their jobs. There was a scene at the school where they were going around the classroom and everyone had to say what their father's job was and everyone was just making it up. And then at the end, somebody said, my father doesn't have a job. And Bukowski was like, why didn't I think of that? Um, and it's the truth. So it just goes to show how the lie came to mind more quickly than the truth, you know? Um, but yeah, his father is so keen to preserve his appearance that he leaves every day and takes the car as if he's going to work. So he leaves the house each morning and comes back in the evening. Uh, Bukowski as well, he had a lot of problems, especially during his teenage years with acne. Um, so he said, I often stood in front of the mirror and stared at myself and wondered how ugly a person could get. And yeah, I mean, he was an ugly guy. And uh, he said he isn't, he wasn't religious because if religion was real, it drew fools. And if it wasn't, they were all the more fools, which I thought was pretty deep. There's a quote here, which I really enjoyed. When someone else's truth is the same as your truth, and he seems to be saying it just for you, that's great. And here Bukowski was talking about, for example, when he discovered Hemingway and he found writers that were expressing themselves the way he wanted to express himself. He said, why is it always a matter of choosing between something bad and something worse? And another great quote. I was just a 50 cent turd floating around in the green ocean of life. War was probably hell, but the in-between parts were boring. And a great quote here again. All of these are just little pithy quotes. The quotes are arguably more interesting than the story as a whole. At the age of 25, most people were finished. A whole goddamn nation of assholes driving automobiles, eating, having babies, doing everything in the worst way possible, like voting for the presidential candidate who reminded them most of themselves. He also said, no wonder men robbed banks. There were too many inferior jobs. And another quote here, women wanted men who made money. Women wanted men of mark. How many classy women were living with skid row bums? Well, I didn't want a woman anyhow, not to live with. How could men live with women? What did it mean? What I wanted was a cave in Colorado with three years worth of foodstuffs and drink. I'd wipe my ass with sand. Anything, anything to stop drowning in this dull, trivial and cowardly existence. All right, just a couple more things I wanted to mention. Uh, two more quotes, really. Uh, three more quotes, sorry. Don't curse me or I'll hang your wig on my mantelpiece. What a great threat. Uh, we also have only assholes talk about writing. Note for uh, author tubers there. Yeah, I also do the same thing. And uh, as long as a man had wine or cigarettes, he could make it. Cheers, Bukowski. So yeah, that's what I made of Ham on Rye. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you've read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.